So what else do I need to say to you in three minutes or probably one minute now? Let's see. Um, so just a quick update the Creative Coromandel is up to. We are um, we are, have almost finalised the first phase of a mentor artist mentoring program, Partner Up, it's called, uh, which has been tremendously successful, working with about nine artists throughout the um, the district. And um, Mayor Sandra, thank you. So of support um, for that funding was 25,000 that we got from Creative New Zealand and I'm certain that that letter from you Sandra did contribute to, to yeah. we would like to implement a second phase of that of that um, that program next year um, I think it's probably time for me to conclude because I'm certain I've had my time However, I'd like to just read out a quote from Elizabeth Van Vanneveld from Auckland University, who is a member of the New Zealand Order, Order of Merit. She says, when culture and well-being are brought together, the resulting concept is a dynamic one, influ influenced not only by arts and cultural activity, but all by, also by such things as economic development, the maintenance of heritage, urban planning, provision, and access to create recreation and sports amenities, community health policies, community development strategies, etc. I say, let's do this together, guys. We can't do it without you. You can't do it without us, frankly, either. So I say, please, let's work together. Rob, would you like to say anything? Welcome, Rob. You're welcome to say a few words, and I'd just like to introduce you as uh, Rob Johnson, the Public Arts um, Trust, or the Arts Public Trust, uh, who do a fantastic job around Thames. And Rob, so if you, if we welcome you to say a few words. Uh, can you hear me okay? I've just unmuted you. Yeah. Is that working? Yes, good. Okay, good. yeah, just um, thanks, Jan, for that presentation. I mean, creative. Coromandel are working really hard. Jan's doing an awful lot of um, the heavy lifting too for the trust. Um, and it's a really, you know, in the last three or four years since um, we, we're trying to implement the, the, the art strategy that's been adopted um, by council initially. And we just, um, we've got some really exciting things going on, but we do need ongoing support. And that's what uh, Jan has sort of tried to outline and we will, um, we would like to make a, a formal presentation later, but this was a way of just introducing where we're at and, and what we're hoping to achieve in the future. We've got some really good stuff going on. And I think um, looking around, you know, um, obviously I'm in, on the um, Public Arts Trust as well. Um, and, and that's, um, you know, partnering up, having a, a, a central um, conduit like Creative Coromandel that's keeping an eye on everything that's going on over the peninsula is really helpful for us. It gives us good links as well as um, individuals and, a, and as a body, the Public Art Trust, to other arts bodies that and um, keeping a track of what's going on all over the place. And I think um, I think Creative Coromandel do a really important job, and I and I certainly hope that they can uh, be supported um, with, in, in partnership with council. But anyway, that's that's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. We, we would like to um, to bring a proposal to you, a full proposal to council, if we may, um, before the end of the year. So, sort of mid December or so. Would that be Would that be okay? You're welcome to send something through, Jen. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Um, I'll just um, see if anybody would like to ask any questions, and just making making everybody aware that um, we do thoroughly support the arts and you only have to look at this chamber to understand the importance of the arts and combining what Jan was talking about, arts, culture and heritage. And um, I, I'm so grateful that we have this wonderful artwork from John who's on the chamber. And, um, and I think that's part of the reason, the importance of the arts to us all is part of the reason why Council initiated the arts strategy under the guidance um, and support at that time of Diane Connors. So just, um, does anybody have any questions of Jan and Rob? I just want to say quickly, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. 
we, there was a bit of audio misplaced there, but we picked up the, the, the gist of what you want to say. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for presenting. Thank you, Terry. Thank, thank you, everybody, Jerry. for your presence. That's all our in the presence. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. How do I get up here? Right. Uh, now, should I'd like to ask our second presenter, um, Dez Ratima from Creative Waikato, but it's not Dez, is it? So, Dez? Oh, sorry, Dez. So you just got some fans on online watching you as well. Um, Did you oh, have somebody oh, else with you? Oh, um, Dez and Paul can, uh, can join us. Please, yeah, you can, please. Okay, oh. Welcome here. Uh, whole team up here, and Martin is actually going to be joining us online. Okay, would you like to? Yeah. So, so, Dears, welcome. Dears, you're Dears. Dears, Paul, Jeremy. Welcome. Lovely to see you all. Tenakoto Kato. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Jeremy Mayo. I'm here on behalf of Creative Waikato, the arts development organisation for the Waikato region. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Paul and Dez, and we'd like to acknowledge the um, work of Creative Coromandel and the presentation that they gave before. Creative Waikato and Creative Coromandel have been linked together over the last, well, since their existence. Um, Paul has been working with them on strategic planning even in this year, I think. So, um, Creative Waikato, for those who are unfamiliar, operates independently across the Waikato region to provide strategic direction and support for sustainable arts, culture and creative development. We work with funders, councils, artists and arts organisations to work collaboratively to ensure that the Waikato prospers with diverse and transformative creative activity. We are the navigators who lead the elevation of creativity in our region and collaborate to provide opportunities for cultural well-being. Let me start by saying that I believe the arts are a vital aspect of the lives of individuals and their communities. Arts and culture can illuminate our inner lives and enrich our emotional world. The arts help us to define and express ourselves as well as to engage with each other in our communities. They are powerful levers for promoting positive social change. The arts function as the conscience of our society. They show us that we make the world rather than simply inherit it. I've been very fortunate to be actively involved in music, theatre and various other art forms for the majority of my life. Early on as a participatory activity through music lessons, school and community drama groups and watching a range of performances. And now more recently as the creator of various arts experiences, as well as in this role as an advocate for the arts as an essential service. The arts are a coping mechanism for humanity and they are central to my daily life. One of the primary reasons we make both public and private investments in the arts <laughs> um, is for the inherent value of culture. The arts can be life enhancing and entertaining whilst, all help, whilst also helping us to define our own identities. The arts have social and educational benefits as well as a whole range of economic ones. They are fundamental to building a healthier society. Creativity can encourage civic engagement, build resiliency and contribute to quality of life. There are numerous studies that highlight the positive outcomes that art and creativity can have on a community and the, the well-being of its people. And it's exciting for me as someone who's involved in community to see various artists and arts groups creating opportunities for people to engage with the arts on many levels and that there can be support for them from people hopefully such as yourselves, who recognise that the value of art is well beyond a price tag, that engagement with art and art making processes is vital. <laughs> as part of a COVID response, we've seen an upsurge in creativity and engagement in the arts. As I've said before, arts served as a coping mechanism. It was a tool to help us come to terms with our situation, to find solace during the lockdown, to find connection with one another, to find peace. Art is a powerful and transformative element that should be at the core of any recovery work, as well as just being a fundamental part of our society. One example of health benefits is a program in the UK called Arts on Prescription, where GPs can prescribe arts. This entails a patient having a meeting with a person knowledgeable about the local arts community that discuss what's going on in their life, and then an arts activity is prescribed. And so far, the trials have had a remarkable success. What is important about the access and in, sorry, what is the impact of access and investment in arts in the community? 
There are countless benefits that can be articulated and measured in a range of ways, but this can be summarised in three key statements. One, the arts increase people's capacity for life. Two, the arts enrich people's experiences. And three, the arts provide powerful applications outside of the artistic experience. Art testifies to the power of the human imagination, the unique capacity we have to dream. It tempts us to move beyond our perceived boundaries and limitations to explore a curious and creative new world of possibilities. And I'm convinced that if more people engage more actively with art, the world would be a much better place. So why are we here? We're collectively dealing with a unique and traumatic period of unexpected change. We're in a time of recovery, and we need to take a moment to explore what possibilities are emerging and how we can activate them. So what we're here talking about is the Waikato Arts Navigator. This is a framework developed by Creative Waikato available to all councils in the wider Waikato region, and its goal is to build a collective vision for arts and creative outcomes for all communities. It aligns with your own art strategy. The ultimate objective of the Waikato Arts Navigator is to have all councils in the region making decisions for arts development with the following outcomes in mind. Creative prosperity, creative experiences, creative well-being, and creative excellence. We know that the Navigator aligns with the long-term plan and, and finds arts-based methodologies to support the vision from this council. We see the arts and culture as being part of the bigger societal ecosystem, one that brings cultural practices into spaces and places and develops outputs which lead to positive outcomes and clear benefits for communities. And there is an ecosystem map attached in your report. That's nice. Tell us what you can read. We also know that an arts-informed lens is applicable to all elements of the work you do, and there's a way to explore how an arts-based understanding can be applied to the community and the way that we can collectively enable the establishment of, clear, of a clear and engaging sense of identity, both within this district and ultimately for the broader Waikato. We know that there are opportunities to see the call to explore your own backyard, to buy local, to support local, and through arts activity we can provide an extended process for that kind of engagement. Arts to serve the community in a range of ways. The artists as first responders in Creative Waikato along with Creative Coromandel can help. We have a pathway for you to work with us around some strategic vision and project planning that can enable more creative work to occur in your district. And this pathway, which is presented in more detail in the report, has us working together to explore opportunities and solutions, activating a process, and then enjoying the outcome. There are some examples of this work so I'm going to invite Des and Paul to quickly talk about it. Uh, so this um, particular example is from the Rakeshi Festival in Japan. So this um, was as a result of some physical devastation after the tsunami in 2011. So one of the um, an artists, or an art collector from Ofunafu, which is in the northeast of Japan, took along a group of artists to her hometown and basically they uh, created a dream shopping street where they had sort of makeshift playgrounds, they had places where people could write wishes and dreams, they could um, cross them to stories with their local community, and it just really galvanised the community to come together after such a um, devastating event. Um, I've got this one, so this is in Seattle, and this was a response to empty shops, so this was um, something that we're seeing a bit at the moment, and I like to see in the future as a result of some economic COVID. Um, so in this area, of pretty grim, and they're having all sorts of problems, and they actually transfer, transformed shop windows into galleries, so they, wouldn't, they didn't even have any staff or anything like that, it was all stuff you do from the street, but you can imagine quite a difference seeing something like this versus a, you know, a dusty shop with a police sign in the, in the window. Um, part of this process can be through performance and performing arts festivals. Um, this is from a festival in Wellington called Cuba Dupa, which has a range of different art forms that um, bring the city alive um, over a weekend. Um, this is um, sort of more play space that pops up in car parks as well as providing a space for the community to be, community to be active participants in the art world. Yeah, this is a, um, an immersive installation space in Santa Fe um, called Meow Wolf. And so it's a yeah, spaces that you're literally immersed in and can kind of move through. 
um, and has been internationally um, successful. Um, this is um, actually you just got a new mural from this artist. This is Eric Pierce. Yes. Um, yes, I'm going down the road, which is very beautiful. Um, so this is from the Big Street Art Festival in Hamilton. But it's, um, the, this, this festival in Hamilton started as a result of Epic Shops as well, actually, um, with the big mall opening up and the city needing a bit of love and revitalization. So um, it's a way of making art very public and very accessible. You don't have to go into a gallery or anything. It's, it's literally in your, in your spaces. So the scope for the potential ideas of this work is extremely flexible and scalable. It depends on the vision that you have and the scope of the outcomes that you wish to enable, as well as the scale of the budget and how that works with the community. Artistic imagination and creativity are not added bonuses for society. They're not the icing on the cake. They're integral to the human spirit and to human aspirations, an essential part of what makes us who we are. Art thinks about the world in its current state and reimagines the world as it could be. Successful recovery is about defining clearly, focusing locally, spending social capital and creating compelling narratives. It is first and foremost about people and places, not about policies and processes. The arts can serve as an antidote to the times of chaos. It can be a route to clarity and it can be a force of resistance and repair, providing new registers, new languages in which to think. Arts can be the catalyst to affect such change. And we at Creative Waikato look forward to working with you all at Council, alongside Creative Coromandel, to explore the possibilities of what arts can do in this time of recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes, Jeremy. I don't think any of us disagree with anything you said in relation to the arts. Um, and um, yeah, so we've got. Teams community board and Sally, Robin, and Martin, who's. I think it's been intriguing for me how much positivity has arisen just in the last fortnight from mm -hmm. our um, new installation and the cost benefit. Um, yeah, it's a, must be sky high in terms of that kind of community connection for us. So, mm -hmm. very positive. So I see Rob still, still on deck from the Public Arts Trust and we just had an installation, a rocket put in the, the main street and it's fantastic. I saw it and I thought, oh my gosh, that, and, and I, I didn't know how I felt about it, but I knew it was going to be controversial, so on that basis I fell in love with it. That's great. <laughs> I mean, that's the great thing about in, investing in arts is actually seeing it as an investment in people. And no, so, it was an investment. Right. It didn't cost us anything. Well, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to... Love you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's so much scope to invest in your community to support the activity, to encourage more of that activity to take place. As um, Jan said, there's an initiative from uh, Creative New Zealand called Ngātoe Arohi, which is an arts in the region fund, which is arts funding that's available places that aren't within Wellington or Christchurch, um, and it, but it does require partnership, and it requires partnership that's both in kind and um, financial. And so anything that you can do to support those things is... I think this is the first time I've ever seen anything at this side of the Halpico Ranges. Right. <laughs> so I don't know if, uh, if uh, uh, my kiddo has come, done anything on this side of the Halpico Ranges ever. Yeah. Paul, Paul, Paul will be able to talk a lot to a lot of detail about that. Mm. Yeah, so I'm, I'll um, talk credit for what I do, and particularly myself have been very active on the peninsula. So working um, you know, closely with credit Coromandel, working with um, Credit Mercury Bay, working with arts groups throughout the peninsula, on guitar, teams. Um, is, is this recently? Oh, yes, we do it last two years. Last two years, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. actually, since, since the beginning of the session. Sorry, I've just been around for about 35 years. So. Yeah, they've been very active. So, but, but I haven't seen the last two years. It's great to be here tonight. Yeah, well, yeah, Credit Waikato's been running for eight years. I've been in this role since February. Yeah. Um, we also had the... <coughs> Recently we ran uh, some, some pop-up events called Best Fest, so that's 
probably the most recent thing I've done here. That was um, a couple of months ago, maybe not even that. So we did one in Thames and there was one in Pityanga as well. And actually since then I was in Coromandel working, um, working with people out there as well. So there's, we're, we're very aware that uh, the Coromandel is, we see it as one of our creative hotspots. It's very active, there's a very really high proportion of creative people, so we're here regularly supporting where we can, and a lot of that is around um, support and advisory. Um, but we also recognise that there's other layers of support that they're needing as well. I'd like just like to mention the Mercury Bay Arts Trust, which really did begin that huge journey of the arts for the Coromandel, in my view, because it was just such an outstanding, um, what, what they put together in terms of the Mercury Bay Artiscape was just really outstanding. And so um, I see that as one of the major beginnings for taking it to a whole new level for the district. It was just brilliant. So look, thank you all very much, Des, Paul, Jeremy. That was really good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Did you tell us how much you want? <laughs> we, we just want more investment in the community. We, we will be um, coming back um, around the town of the long term plan to help to um, advise that. A big part of this is about seeing Creative Waikato as a strategic partner. So we're not necessarily an organisation that runs events with community groups to enable them to do work better. Um, and we work with councils around the strategic area. So that may also be why we may not be as visible because we're working in the background of the groups. Yeah, uh, is this one of your Supporters, Martin, did he want to say a few words? Or, uh, no, that's, he's on the gambling. Oh, yeah, I I thought somebody else was on the line with you, but that's okay, we're all good, we'll move right along. We won't Thank you. That Thank, one. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so um, we're moving right along. Do you want to have a mover and a seconder? Mover, I'm on second of the public forum. Yep. Terry, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carry. Thank yep. you. And items not on the agenda, there being none. Any conflicts of interest? There being none. We move into hearings for the gaming policy. And our first submitter is Michael Williams, who is online with us. Hello, Michael. So that's submission number 68. Sorry, I'll just go to that. Is that me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, so I'll come on straight into that. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. We're the so welcome, Michael. I've done some things slightly out of order, but we the hearing. And um, we welcome you to make your presentation for your submission to the gambling policy. Right, just to confirm that you're speaking with Michael Williams um, representing the Whangamata Club. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, yes we can. Perfectly good. That's fantastic. Um, look, uh, as you know, we did put in a submission and um, our area of, of uh, interest is um, club mergers. Just before that, we certainly do support um, host responsibility around uh, gaming machines. And uh, clubs are renowned for being very upfront as far as this is concerned. We, of course, uh, know who our people are in, in most of the instances, and um, we monitor those very well in, in association with DIA guidelines. Um, personally, myself, I've been in hospitality for 30 years, and well, over 30 years. I date back to gaming machines from when they first um, entered. Uh, pubs as I first worked in and um, have worked in clubs for the last 25 years. I certainly like clubs because um, we do have control over who we are and the patrons are, um, which uh, gives us a, a high level of host responsibility. Um, and uh, to us, that's uh, extremely important. And I know that's important to the whole clubs movement. Um, so we support the sinking lid policy, we support the um, gambling uh, policy that the TCD is putting together. What we would like to see, however, is the section on club mergers, um, which we believe um, is, is disadvantaged to the community, um, mm -hmm. because in most instances, as we put in our submission, uh, 
clubs do merge. Um, there's a lot of examples of that throughout the throughout the country, and it's really assisted other groups uh, that the groups that have joined together to make sure that they maintain some form of viability with regards to funding, um, and we find that quite important. Um, so we would like to see that uh, that some policy uh, along the national guidelines where up to 30 machines could be merged, whether that be one or two clubs. At the moment, you have a, a formula of more than uh, more than two clubs. You multiply by nine, which leaves 18, which we already have. So, for example, if we were to merge and <laughs> with another club, um, and that club sort of was struggling a little bit with funding or running the club as a whole, which we know some do, uh, then to, if that was just one other club, then to go to 18, we'd already be there. So we would like to see that uh, that formula went to, if two clubs joined or as many clubs joined together, that that went to the, to the national maximums, which could be up to 30 machines. Um, or ultimately the, you know, the number of machines that though, that, uh, that other, outfit has or that other organization has uh, the reason being is that you know if we if you take some examples um, possibly a lot of a lot of mergers in the in New Zealand have been through RSAs and other working men's clubs etc um, and RSA is a very valid cause of welfare and everything else within the country um, and to increase that would make sure that they maintain some funding in, in that area and actually support the community in a, in a bigger way and of course in a safer way because it's within a club. Um, as the submission says, this is not unusual. It has been happening and we'd like just to see that that is cleared up. I think it might have been an oversight at the time in the formula uh, that went about in the last time. So that's where we're submitting. Is there any questions on that? No, I think it's been well put. Um, but we'll sit there. Michael, so just ask my colleagues, do you have any questions of Michael? Because uh, it, it reads with the other ones, and, and it's just around this merging. Yeah, yeah Michael, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate what you're saying too. And support that comes from the club's gaming machines in terms of community facilities and community organisations, that's important to what you do as well, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we offer a lot of free space for, for community organisations that possibly would otherwise be coming to the council, um, and so do our fellow clubs down the road. So if it per happened in the in the distant future, um, all the clubs, fortunately, in Fongata are operating absolutely wonderfully um, and supporting the local community. But if it did happen in the future, then we'd be able to maintain that in a greater manner and have greater facilities for the community. Can, can I just, um, well, just wanted to ask you, Michael, um, do you think that by having the emerging of clubs and also keeping some of those, you know, the gaming machine numbers, that you've got a better, better, you're in a better position to have some oversight of people that might get caught up in a problem gambling way rather than drive them into online? <coughs> online? With, without a doubt, and that's a very good point. Um, we consider online quite a quite a dangerous and and um, unpoliced area, to be quite honest. In my dealings with the the DIA, so yes, if you could, uh, it's it's a bit like alcohol, exactly the same. If you can bring people, I believe, into a social environment, there's a protection around that. And clubs have been at the forefront um, of, of making sure that we do protect our people, we do protect our members, and having all of those people in, in one area is, is a lot easier to manage, I'm sure, and, and to police. Great, thank you. Uh, any other? There be no, oh, sorry, Tony. Yeah, my was only a comment, and it's picking up on what Sandra had said. It is, if you remove the gambling from on-site venues to online, and I noticed one thing is for TAB, it's a sinking limit. There's a library coming. There are very few, but many towns don't even have TABs and you can't find them anymore. But you do it online and the problem gets worse. Because people start using credit cards, but you run out of money in the puddle when you are a TAB environment or a gaming environment, it's bring you out of money. But online you just keep the temptation is to keep feeding it. Of a credit card, so I'll just pick up on that. Uh, but okay. I know people say they support it, but I don't know if they really realise what happens on the other side of it. Tony was just talking, reinforcing the fact that 
um, if you go online, nobody knows about it. You just feed the machine. Oh, without a doubt. Yes, yes, I totally agree. There's um, there, there's a lot more control when people are in that environment. <laughs> I have the same I have the same issue with alcohol. To be quite honest, um, I'd like to see some more controls where where you bring it inside into the social environment where we can help control with that too. So they're they're quite uh, addiction is quite um, similar through through all all of those areas and and when you can get support and help from a group it's it's much more important um and so you know we certainly support uh, harm minimization um and and problem gambling within the community thank you silly did you have well i was just talking at the risk of starting to debate rather than listen to yes, we are. and so going to put my point in. <laughs> people that are poverty, you know, don't make assumptions about how many credit cards we have in our pockets. A lot of poor people do not have credit cards. So, oh, good sure. Yeah. So he's just keeping us on the straight and narrow. So thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. That's right. So yes, we certainly support uh, better uh, management of the merger, merger option here up to the national guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to speak to you. Oh, okay, so it's been a, a, slight, there was a slight change around in the um, in the order. So we just invite Jared. Okay. And that um, is 181. Good morning, I'm Jared True. I represent the Gaming Machine Association of New Zealand. Uh, we represent the vast majority of the gaming societies throughout the country. Uh, we're asking you today to consider replacing the sinking level of the cap at current numbers. We're not looking to increase the machines, we're looking at the cap at current numbers. And we're asking that the status quo relocation policy be retained. The cap, uh, cap as opposed to a sinking level, is now reasonable given that the very low problem gambling rate, the benefit that comes from having the local machines, the apps online gambling. It's now appropriate to consider perhaps a slight change in policy. In New Zealand, our problem gambling rate is extremely low by international standards. It's only 0.2% of the adult population, and that's all forms of gambling, not simply gaming machine gambling. The Ministry of Health, who funds all the treatment providers, they fund the, the OAM helpline, the tech services, the email services, the counselling services. As part of the funding contracts, they require you to give it to ask the people that that text or to email or phone which district they came from, and they keep a record of each 12 months. The most recent set of data in a 12 month period, only three persons from 10 square districts sought out for problem gambling. You compare your population to other districts, and that figure is very, very low. There is no link between gaming machine numbers and problem gambling. Over the last 10 years, we've had 25% of our machines nationally go. Over 4,600 machines have, have been removed, and during that same 10 year period, the problem gambling rate has been So that is the same. The Council Social Impact Assessment Report included the, the assessment that's done from the, the Ministry of Health, where you plug in a lot of variables and you come up with either a, a low risk profile, which suggests an open policy, a medium risk profile, which would suggest a cap. Or if we had a high risk profile, that would justify a the policy. Uh, your, your district has a, a medium risk profile. Medium risk profile suggests a cap, like a cap of current numbers, as opposed to the most stringent policy you could adopt, which is a second risk policy. We look at the benefits that come from playing our machines. Uh, first of all, it's player entertainment. 67% of us gamble at least once a year. Uh, we pay $1.71 million to local hospitality businesses and the venue payment to host the machines, support the machines, and, and to supervise the machines. Hospitality businesses are um, very reliant, particularly at the moment, on, on that revenue that's received. We pay $3.8 million, this is from your local machines, $3.8 million through to the government of all our taxes, and $4.28 million in community funding, including the funding of the six clubs that you have here used internally and the external grants that they make as well. The Problem Gambling Foundation sort of changed their focus a little bit. They used to talk about the harm that comes from gaming, gaming machines, but given now that the problem gambling rate is so low and so, so flat, and we only have three people seeking help in the district in a 12 month period, they now talk about, well, if we didn't have gambling, people should, would go and spend money in, in your retail stores, and that would support your local economy. 
Do, do you honestly think that if people stopped spending money on gambling, you didn't spend forty dollars on a gaming machine, you're going to go home to the local clothes shop and spend forty dollars on the local clothes shop? There's no, there's no direct correlation there. And PGF's report is also very one-sided. What I've done is I said, oh, if we take all the money that's spent on gambling, we put it onto your, onto your retail stores, this is the benefit you'll get. They have no regard to what would happen if you took that, the, the 10, million, $10 million that's spent on gambling, took that away, took that grant money away, what the consequences of that would be. And of course, they don't take into account the money that we give out in grants. It is for them to the local, local uh, regional stores. They don't take the money that's spent, spent by way of venue payments, goes to the hospitality businesses, and they don't take into account the grants that we make to local people for wages, coaching, and counseling services. They move to online. I, I, I always um, get in trouble asking this question when was the last time everyone actually bought a CD disc to music? Anyone here? Couple? Uh, do you have any video stores here locally still? <clears throat> Anyone got the yellow pages and used it in the last two, three months? <laughs> my, my kids wouldn't know what the yellow pages are. I can see these two, though. It's funny. People have always gambled, and people will always gamble. Who can tell me what this is this, this gentleman are doing here? Penny toss the answer needs to To a Give people two coins and they'll still gamble. So they've always gambled that this is one of our menus. Uh, all of these games that are available here. You pass me your phone or your tablet, give me three minutes, and I can be playing exactly the same game. The only difference is this will be faster, and the, the prices will be higher, and it'll be done on a credit card. Even Sky City's got its own online, online casino now. So, uh, back in 2017, so this has been increasing, uh, the, the government's done a report, and they've, they've said that we're spending over $300 million on option providers. That was back in 2017. Uh, back, back in the same period, approximately 60% of the TAB's turnover was online. People would say, well, if we take the physical venues away, people won't gamble. We already are. And the growth of online gambling is, is growing exponentially between 5 and 100% a year. So, so do you think, I'm just, just going to jump in and ask a question while it's sort of there. Um, do you think the reduction of machines where the gambling actually stayed the same, is, do you think that's because of online or not? Because the gambling stayed the same even with the reduction of machines. Uh, I think we have, to, we have two forces in play. If you, if you remove the, the physical option, people will then go and seek out a, a, another option. Um, plus, as, as, as our kids grow up, all, all of our kids and grandkids who are using tablets these days, people they can talk. They could use your phone and use your iPad before they could say, my mum wants some, want some dinner, thanks. Um, so you've got a generation that are growing up. My kids would never, if they wanted to buy a lot of it, go drive to the supermarket and stand in a queue and wait five minutes to get the paper. That would just be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. So if we look at our venues a little bit online, our venues are public venues. They've got trained supervised staff helping out of you. The maximum you can bet on our machines is only $2.50. The maximum prize you can win on our machines is only $1,000. And you need cash in your pocket to play. The online world, you don't have the privacy of going home, you can lose your home without leaving it. There's no venue staff helping out of you, providing you support. Staff campus, campus beside of you with the 800 number, no posters on the wall. Unlimited prizes, and all done on credit cards. We provide $20 million a year. We, we self fund all the treatment, treatment providers. We fund the 0800 numbers, the counseling services. It all comes out of the gambling industry by way of the gambling We've Got to be 18 years of age to pay our machines. We don't offer any interest to gamble. And we have an exclusion order system. If you're gambling heavily, you've got a tap on the shoulder and you've asked whether you'd like to have a break and whether you'd like to exclude yourself from the venue. In the online world, they provide no money to help the very easy access by miners. If you are a heavy gambler and you take a break, you get an email saying, you're a great customer. We've now enrolled you in our platinum club. Here's a $100 credit. We've missed you. Come back and carry on playing. We also contribute significantly by way of taxes, 20% in gaming duty, 50% in GST, provide local employment, staff, supervised machines, and if you win, you get a prize. 
online world, there's no tax revenue, no local employment, no guarantee return. Could they change that tax revenue paradigm? They can try, but at the moment it's all done by offshore operators. Uh, the government is very much conscious of the growth of online gambling and is very much in the let's join them because we can't beat them base and looking at granting licenses for New Zealand operators so they can tax it and they can put harmonisation um, around it. During the COVID lockdown, my phone was going every two or three days with people ringing up saying, I've been gambling online and I've won a prize from one of the draft pots and they won't pay me out. So when you when you actually win a prize in these offshore providers, the risk and insurance companies to when it actually comes to getting some money out, get, oh no, 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 no. Point twenty-six A of our terms and conditions says your when you sign up, that's got to be exactly the same number as in your credit card. Or sorry, you won using free spins, we're not gonna pay you back. So and then trying to track them down and find out where you can get your prize when they're based in Russia or Russia or wherever. Thank you for that. Thank you. I've got my to away during proceedings while it was hot, so thank you very much. Um, any questions, Terry? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very, very thorough presentation. When I read through the gaming uh, policy and that, you know, an interesting 92 cents is returned back to the community in some form. I think it's a fantastic return on a, which really is a recreational hobby for some people. So they actually support the community in an amazing way without knowing it. And you know, they, if you didn't get that support coming back to the community, they'd be, they'd be coming to us to get that support. So we can see what's happening. And it's got the controls and the clubs, so I, I think it's, it's good. Anybody else have any questions of Jerry? There'd be none. Thank you very much, Jerry. We appreciate you taking time to come over. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so the next submitter is Tanya. Is Tanya with us? Hello, yes, I'm here. <laughs> can you can you hear me clearly? Yes, you're welcome. And and please please make your submission. We're all listening. Thank you. Thanks. I've I've got some slides, so I'm hoping I can show share those with you. Uh, there we go. Um, can you see those? Yeah. Okay, thank, um, so yes, I'm Tanya Peters from New Zealand Community Trust, and um, I'm just going to run through the, um, the main highlights of our written submission, which you should all have received. So thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you this morning. Um, so we know that um, gambling is a, is a popular entertainment in, in New Zealand, and um, according to the uh, Ministry of Health's most recent study, about 75% of Kiwis regularly participate in gambling for entertainment. Um, our position about your policy uh, is, is the same as the, uh, the Gaming Machine Association position that, that Jared's just outlined. Uh, we would suggest that you replace the sinking lid with a cap based on the current number of gaming machines, which is 258. And this is because your social impact assessment has shown that the, that the sinking lid is not warranted, that a cap is the most appropriate approach for a, a medium risk community. Um, we'd also ask that you retain the current relocation provision, and I'll come back to some reasons why relocations are a good thing a bit later. Um, just to cover how much funding has come back to uh, Thames Coromandel from NZCT itself, we've returned over $409,600 to Thames Coromandel in the year to September 2020. And of course, that is substantially lower than we would normally have returned um, in a typical financial year because our venues were closed for two months. Uh, during the COVID-19 shutdown, so we would normally have um, that, that amount would normally be quite a bit higher. Um, we'd also like I'd also like to just remind the council that the council itself is a significant funder of a significant recipient of NZCT funds. Over the last six years, we've um, we've granted the council about six, about two hundred thousand um, dollars. As Jared has already explained, the sector is regulated by the government to protect the community, and uh, we believe that the, the independent gaming trust like NZCT provide good transparency and governance and best practice on behalf of communities. And there's a quite a long list of measures that we have in place for harm minimization, um, actually in my submission towards the back. Um, as Jared has also mentioned, uh, the uh, problem gambling rate is currently about 0.2% of the adult population in New Zealand. 
And you'll be able to see from the graph here that um, the number of gaming machines has been steadily declining since the Gambling Act was um, enforced in 2003. And, but the gambling rate at, uh, has stayed static over that period of time. So we certainly see no correlation between removing machines and, and the problem gambling rate. We think the sinking lid is a very blunt instrument and that there are much more effective ways of reducing problem gambling, um, such as allowing venues to relocate out of um, low deprivation uh, suburbs. Uh, as is, yes, and again, as has already been mentioned, there is a substantial problem gambling levy in place um, of $20 million per year, of which um, NZCT is a, a substantial contributor. And we do realise that it is a ban balancing act for councils um, to get your, your policy um, covering the community benefit as well as um, uh, as, in, as uh, dealing with, with harm minimisation. And so, as, as I mentioned before, about 10,000 gaming machines disappeared between 2003 and 2018. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the funding that that has reduced, it's gone down by $89 million. So in $89 million more was available in 2003 for, for the community than was available in 2018. So that just gives you an idea of the amount of funding that's been reduced due to the lack of due to that reduction in machines. So reducing the gaming machine numbers hasn't reduced problem gambling, as we saw from that graph, but it has reduced the community funding by quite a significant amount. So just to come back to relocations, um, they are a, a tool to help um, uh, help with problem gambling by allowing venues to relocate out of high deprivation areas. And I know that's something you have proposed, but we would also like you to keep the current clause because it supports your local hospitality businesses and jobs. It allows venue operators to make their own business decisions about when they move and, and preserves um, income and jobs for the, that may disappear if, um, if venues are not able to relocate for their own purposes. It also allows you as a council to respond to future demand and it allows the appropriate responsibility to be placed on venue operators if they are the owner of their, um, their property rather than the landlords who have no responsibility for harm minimisation. And they can just trap uh, businesses there um, by hiking up rents when they know that they, they have nowhere else to go. So that's my presentation. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Does anybody have any questions of Tanya? There have been none. Tanya, that was excellent. Um, so I think some of the questions have been asked and answered previously. So thank you very much for your considered submission, which we'll be giving some thought to um, when we do consider them at a later time. So appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thanks for the chance to speak to you all this morning. Thank you. We appreciate it as well. Okay, so um, if we invite Paula Snowden. Um, we actually have Tina speaking on behalf of Paula Snowden. Tina. Kia ora. Kia ora. So, um, okay, you were speaking on behalf of Paula, so welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Tina McIver. I work at the, as the health promotion lead at the Problem Gambling Foundation. I'm based in Wellington. Um, we have an interest in minimising harm throughout the country, and that is mandated by the Gambling Act. Uh, 2003, that um, we should be concerned about minimising harm to society at large. Uh, we run addiction counselling services throughout the country in many offices. Uh, our closest to Thames Coromandel would be our Hamilton office or Rotorua. We have a counsellor there. Um, the experts because these machines are designed to be addictive. They, are, they cause dopamine rush in the brain. Uh, you talked about 92 cents being returned to every dollar, but that's regressive. So you put your 92 cents back in and you get 82 back. And then you put your 82 in, you get 72. And it goes down, down, down. These machines are designed for people to lose their money in them. I mean, you've just got to look at the $10.7 million lost to Thames Coromandel. Now you've got to keep that figure in your mind. 2019, $10.7 million lost to poker machines in Thames Coromandel. So we support your current sinking lid policy. Um, no new venues. Um, there is research that connects um, access to poker machines to harm. Um, 
and that's still current. Um, right, I'm going to try and share some slides. Um, actually, first of all, we support a sinking lid with no relocations, no club mergers, so that the sinking lid actually sinks. Like you've maintained, was it 200, 248 pokies in the area for quite some time? and you've only lost a few over the last five years. And that's happening throughout the, throughout the country um, with relocation policies, club mergers, um, and a third of the country having sinking lids. What we're finding is that machine numbers <coughs> are going down ever so slowly. But spend is increasing and spend is an indicator of harm. Right. <laughs> Can I ask a question on that while you're while we're sort of there? Because it's that it's the reduction of machines versus the online. Right, so are you going to be covering that in your present? I know I'm jumping ahead a wee bit, but I'm really interested in that that um, dichotomy, if you like. Absolutely. Now, I can't believe the amount of time spent um, at council hearings talking about online gambling. It's not even your jurisdiction. You're not here oh. to consider online gambling. The central government, that's their job. Um, and they've put out a consultation document last year. Um, there's going to be a bill before parliament very soon. Um, your jurisdiction is class war gambling in your area. And that's where you need to make decisions. And that's where the harm occurs. I mean, we we still find that 50% of all our clients, pokies in pubs and clubs, are the highest number of clients that we get. That's 50% of them. So um, it is, it's causing the most harm. In your own area, you've got them clustered in medium to high deprivation areas. Uh, I can't seem to share my presentation. I don't quite know how to do that. Uh, can we help with that? We have given you some instructions in the chat. <laughs> can we? If I put that on my screen, can you share my screen? Yes, that's what we were typing. If you were telling me about sharing the screen. Have you got it? No. Okay. You want to tell it what's a lost story? Okay, I'll just uh, carry on then. She can give us a presentation. We can send it out. So, so Tanya, um, Ariana was just saying that, that if you send us the presentation that that you can't get up on screen, we yeah. can make sure the count is really get a couple there. Yeah, I'll send it, uh, instead of wasting time now, I'll send it after the present after I've spoken. OK, okay. all right. Um, so. I'll go back to um, some of our main points. So you've got 20 venues in Thames Coromandel with 248 pokers. You all know that that's 99 EGMs to every adult who lives there. You've got the fourth highest spend on pokey machines per head of population in the country. Um, according to our funding report as well, that just looked at a quarter, uh, a quarterly spend, you had the second highest. That is huge. Um, only $2.6 million of that 10.7 million lost has been returned to community groups. So we've so we've done the figures on that, and that's supposed to be transparent. You're supposed to be able to see that very easily from the DIA, but it's actually really hard to find those figures. Um, in any case, 40% is supposed to be returned to community groups and sports organisations. I mean, wouldn't it be fabulous if you could actually fund some of those arts uh, initiatives that were talked about earlier. And um, it was really interesting that Jared True spent a lot of time on PGF's um, NZIER report, which is, you know, uh, the Institute of um, Economic Research. It's a, it's a completely independent report. And it talks about how many jobs could be created in, in um, 
TLAs with the money that's lost on pokies. So wouldn't I mean, wouldn't it be better to to see that money being diverted to 40 jobs in your area? That's the calculation for Thames Coromandel um, so that you haven't got these dark pokey dens uh, that are causing addiction and causing financial stress and harm to your community. So, um, so on that, um, in terms of the club merger clause, of course, um, we would we wouldn't support um, your the the previous submitter's idea that you know thirty pokies in one room is better than eighteen pokies. And um, what you find is when you get more and more pokies together, actually you get more problems, and it is more difficult to exercise host responsibility. You know, you've essentially got a pokey den or a mini casino there, and uh, and clubs shouldn't be propped up by pokey machines. I mean, clubs are there for other reasons, um, other activities. You know, bowling or, or or other social events. They shouldn't be propped up by these machines. You would think it'd be better not to. Okay, so in terms of problem gambling, um, Jared True talked about 0.2 percent of the population. Well, um, according to the Ministry of Health strategy to prevent and minimise harm, there's actually 252,000 people in New Zealand that are being harmed by gambling. So that's 5% of the population. And that 252,000 people is pretty much the, the population of Hamilton and surrounding areas. It's a huge number of people. And for each of those people, five to 10 others, family members, whānau, are affected as well. And that's where you sort of get into financial harm is harm as well. I mean, uh, you've got that 0.2% in the population, that's actually where the harm is really extreme. You've got people in prison. You've got um, you've got you know um, family violence is a, is one of the things associated with problem gambling. Uh, you've got children going to school without lunch. You've got um, reduced performance in work and education, relationship disruption, criminal activity, and um, and the financial harm. I mean, it's really quite obvious when you've got these machines that are addictive, clustered in these high deprivation areas, that financial harm is going to be the outcome. Okay. I think I've covered many of the points in my slide. Um, also, there is research to show that people didn't move on to online gambling dur during um, the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, that research has come out of the uh, Health Promotion Agency. Um, it showed that, yeah, there was there was no huge move to online, and it's because People who are addicted to poker machines are addicted to that environment. Um, in any case, the, the, the central government is dealing with that area. Okay, and one more statistic for you is that this money, the community funding, 30% of that comes from harmful gambling. So this is DIA research. So you've got an awful lot of people coming uh, of that community funding that was only 2.6 million out of the 10 million in Coromandel um, comes from people who are actually harmed. So um, that's why we support your sinking lid. Um, it's better if it keeps sinking, um, not to allow relocations and club mergers altogether, but we wouldn't um, support um, increasing your, your number of uh, machines in a club merger and we would support your new relocation policy as it is, um, that's if you have to have one, um, rather than um, the previous version. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just ask, in your submission, the yep. um, Pie chart which identifies the primary gambling mode. Yep. Right. So predominantly 45 percent point eight six eight is uh, non-casino gaming machines. Is the 7.91 percent all that applies to the online or other? 
or you're not including online in here? Um, now, this information isn't from us. Oh, um, sorry. I'm looking, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong submission for that particular one. Sorry, Big can I, can I just ask straight out then, without, without going back through, what's the percentage between gaming machine and online addiction? What's the percentage between the two? Well, no one's got that information at the moment. The government's looking for that information. There's been very little research on what's really happening in terms of people going online. Uh, and, and looking at our responsibilities in terms of class four, you're yep. saying that there's, just wanting clarification on this, you're saying there's absolutely no relationship between class four gambling and uh, online, depending, in, if, uh, depending on the policies that are introduced? There is no relationship. Well, so, I, I would say... We introduce class four... So whatever we do around class four doesn't have an impact on online. Yeah, there's no research to say that that, that it would. Okay, thank you. Are there any, any further questions of Tanya? No, I really appreciate that, Tanya. And if you could send your presentation, we're terribly sorry that you couldn't put that up. <laughs> and okay. much everybody gets a copy. But, you know, it's really good that you can present from Wellington. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Have a great day on the Coromandel. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> right, so is it Paula next? No, it's Niall. We've got Niall next. Niall. It's Niall with us. There we go, Niall. Good morning. How are you? Good. We're good. We can hear you loud and clear. So fire away, Niall. Excellent, cool. Right, well, I'm from uh, TAB New Zealand, uh, which is probably uh, better recognised under its former name as the Racing Board. Uh, the TAB uh, was uh, resaturated under the um, Racing Industry Act in August uh, of this year, uh, replacing the Racing Board and the Racing Act 2003. Um, I'm here mainly to speak about uh, TAB board venues within the district. Uh, however, I do have a few comments on, on class four as well. Uh, we do uh, also support um, a, a cap approach rather than a sinking lid, uh, but we certainly um, rebuke a, um, um, a sinking lid approach to TAB board venues. Uh, TAB board venues uh, are venues that are either leased or owned by the TAB and are used uh, exclusively for wagering. Uh, there are none in uh, your district, um, um, which may come as a surprise to you because your um, officer PAC says there are three. Um, we do have uh, TAB um, pub tabs or club tabs, which is a TAB offering within a bar or a club. Uh, that can be either a sort of uh, a person-to-person -person service or it can be a, a self-service terminal itself. Um, TAB board venues are the safest environment to participate within gambling because it's all we do. We, we offer gambling products and we offer them in a safe um, location and a safe environment that is monitored uh, with staff that are fully trained within home minimisation. Um, just want to make a few comments on uh, relocations. We, we support a relocation policy. Uh, we find it quite disappointing that certain groups um, uh, accuse, us of, accuse us of putting um, class war machines or gambling products in high deprivation areas and then block us from being able to move them out of those areas. We, we find that quite disappointing. And there's been a few comments on overseas gambling. Um, we obviously are very interested in our, our market share, particularly from a wagering point of view, uh, on an international stage. And we have um, estimated that the New Zealand online uh, overseas gambling spend for the 12 months of July was $580 million, uh, which includes about a, 125 on wagering and 450 on online casino games. Uh, the online casino games, uh, it was uh, a 55% increase year on year. 
and the July um, quarter was $139 million and the April uh, quarter was $119 million, which represent a 133% uh, increase and a 67% increase on their year-on-year -year, um, uh, comparisons. So to say there was no transfer of uh, gambling when venues were closed to an online basis is is uh, not true. Um, um, we there was also a comment before about uh, TAB online gambling uh, from a, a councillor. Um, it, we are one of the two approved providers of online gambling within New Zealand, along with the Lotteries Commission. Um, when you bet with the TAB, you have to have an account. The account is monitored. Uh, you have options available to you to uh, limit your, your spend or your, um, your winnings. Um, and it's the same with uh, with the Lotteries Commission. Um, you are also limited to how much you can deposit and play per week. Um, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Right, okay. Um, any questions for Noah? Does anybody have any questions? No, no, they all seem to be. Uh, so thank you for the... Um, the 67% increase figure on the online gambling. Um, so you, this comes from accumulated statistical data, I presume. This comes yeah, from our, from our uh, um, uh, business partners and, and uh, algorithms that we apply to those uh, market share. We're obviously uh, in business with a, a company called OpenBet, which works with um, international bookmakers, and we apply that to uh, the online casino market as well. Right. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed. Great to have you with us and um, thank you. Thank you. Right, now we have one last submitter, Martin Chia. Martin. <coughs> Hello, Martin. Welcome aboard. Do you, do you want to unmute? Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm now no longer silent and hiding no, in the background. You're all good, you're all good now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, for my sins, I'm the Chief Executive of Pub Charity Limited. Um, I've been doing that job now for 13 years. Uh, we've operated machines in Thames Coromandel almost continuously since they were introduced in 1987. Um, I've attended uh, policy hearings over the years, um, and the, the Thames uh, Coromandel Council has always prided itself as being progressive. Uh, and was one of the first to actually adopt a sinking lid approach to gaming machines uh, when policies were required following the Gambling Act. Uh, and at the time uh, that uh, sinking lids were advocated, uh, the gaming industry in, in New Zealand had exploded from a very unregulated and minor player to the dominant player in the gambling sector, um, moving from uh, a few thousand machines to 25,000 machines across the country. Uh, in response to that, the Labor government at the time uh, proposed the, uh, the Gambling Re uh, Review Bill, which became the Gambling Act, um, and that uh, in it had a policy setting requiring local governments to have policies. Prior to that, local governments had very little to do with um, gambling and gambling licences. Um, I give you that background just by way of context because the the actual legislation, uh, the context for that legislation was drafted in the year 2000. That was about five years before the first iPhone was released and uh, broadband internet was just a dream. So the, the um, asymmetrical nature of information provision meant that um, the average person uh, could not access gambling other th than through a licensed operator. So, uh, and the state controlled almost all of those opportunities and the idea that an offshore operator could come in was literally like the Reader's Digest thing that would turn up in the mail allow you to participate in the global office. <laughs> like many things, the state controlled all access for the public to gambling opportunities. Well, that, that asymmetrical relationship with, with uh, gambling opportunities and many other things has, has actually been eroded year after year to the point now where the state has very little control over what people are accessing um, through online portals and, and um, both good and bad. Uh, and some things are very bad. And, and this um, gradual um, sort of uh, erosion or disruption of existing um, uh, 
uh, activities is is now accepted worldwide. The idea that someone could suggest that online gambling is not uh, a factor and, and uh, would um, actually dismisses all the work that Tracy Martin did in her role of Minister of Internal Affairs because her entire three-year term in that role was spent developing policy for central government for online. They are very concerned <laughs> the lack of control, the lack of revenue gathering, as most governments are, um, and the harm minimisation prospects. And, and um, I'm interested when people say, uh, you know, over time the amount of harm associated with our industry has declined. Um, and to the point now where uh, around about 45% of people that seek help are for our product. I never hear any anybody talking about the other 55%. And those, those are influences affecting your community. But in saying that, of all these millions of people that um, the Problem Gambling Foundation were talking about that were affected, only three people saw fit to actually seek help in the Thames Coromandel District in the last 12 months. Now, some, something's wrong. Either the, the state has failed in its duty to provide care to its citizens, or in fact, the problem's not quite as large as what it's being painted. And it's really the latter uh, rather than the former, because there's a big gap between tens of thousands of people in Thames Coromandel suffering and, and actually three people seeking help and being registered in the Ministry of Health database. And, and for my presentation, because I'm seen as conflicted, I understand that I turn up, I represent the industry, um, I, I, rather than focus on what I think, I thought I might just introduce a couple of uh, um, key pieces of evidence, I think, in your um, uh, in your considerations for whether this policy that you've been sitting on for quite a while now is really doing the job. And I was quite concerned when I saw the staff refer to a sinking lid as a gold standard. I think that shows a degree of bias because it's not gold standard anything, to be honest. It's an ideological uh, wish list um, that makes people feel comfortable at night that they've done something effective. But in, in real terms, uh, the sinking lid is like sticking one finger in the dike while many others emerge in the dam as it's crumbling all around you, but you feel good because your finger's doing something. Uh, and, and, in, uh, you know, you just need to look at the empirical evidence. Now, I'm going to try and bring up a presentation. Let's hope it works. Right, there it is. Right. So I've, I've got uh, only got a, uh, where are we, uh, slideshow from the beginning, right. Uh, I've only got a couple of slides here, and really this is the guts of the argument. Um, actually, before I get into it, I just want to comment about demographics. There were some comments made about per capita spend and per capita um, machine exposure that were quite alarmist. One thing I'd point out is the Thames Coromandel area is, is the jewel and the Hauraki crown, isn't it, really? You, probably, you live there because you know the secret. I've been there. I've got friends that have got batches there. I've fished off the mussel barges. In fact, my most successful fishing has been off those mussel barges. You know the secret, right? And lots of other people do, but they're not smart enough to live there all the time. They just come down at the weekend. So rather than just the holiday season where Thames Coromina swells to two and a half times its population, people are continually coming down. And, and my friends, basically, who live in Hamilton, go to their batch in, in, in uh, Kaituna basically every weekend. So the idea that your population is limited to those represented on census night has skewed those numbers and is misleading. But anyway, coming back to that, this is the guts of the argument that's put to you about why you need a sinking lid. You're promised three things, basically. A reduction in problem gambling prevalence in the community, a reduction in gambling spend, and, and also, ironically, and I can't ever figure this out, don't worry about the community funding. It's death. It's this very slow process, so nobody will notice. So those are the three things that you as decision makers uh, are, are, are promised that your policy is delivering. Okay, so here's now Professor Max Abbott recently disgraced Professor Max Abbott, but he wasn't disgraced because his research was no good. He was disgraced because he took a bit of a liking to a fellow researcher in Australia. Um, but anyway, he's considered a global expert in problem gambling research. And this is a statement from some research he didn't. So this has been available since 2006. You don't hear the Problem Gambling Foundation talking about it. So he basically, he concluded that gaming machine reductions and the introduction of caps or sinking lids, really that summarise that, appear to have little impact. More recently, in some jurisdictions that have experienced prolonged and increased availability of gaming machines, prevalence rates of problem gambling have remained constant or declined. So playing around with the numbers, it's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't accurately reflect the nature of the behaviour. People are, you know, the, the alcoholic is going to be the last one to leave the party. The person that has a problem with gambling is going to find a gambling opportunity. Now, the choice that you're offering is a controlled and supervised environment where their behaviour might be identified, or you're going to push them into 
um, activities whether it's not controlled or supervised. And, and that's really the choice that people have with these policies. Now, back in 2000 and 2003, when the Act was passed, that wasn't a choice. It was like a pub or, or nowhere or a golden Kiwi ticket, and that was about it. Well, the world's changed. So the, that's not me saying this, that caps don't work and sinking lids don't work. This is the leading uh, one of the global leading researchers into problem gambling. And then the Ministry of Health himself basically looked at the statistics and, and what they concluded was there's been no change in the problem gambling prevalence rate since around 2006. In fact, they went back further and said really hasn't changed much since the late 1990s. So while we've dismantled class four on the promise that we're going to see a, a change in the problem gambling prevalence rate for problem gambling and moderate risk gambling, which is where if there is any harm, it's in those statistics and they're unchanged. So we're pulling the lever and we've been pulling this lever for uh, since 2007 in most cases, and, and it's not working, and yet people will turn up this year and they'll turn up in three years' time and say, pull it a bit harder, it might work soon, sometime. You know, keep yanking on the lever. Um, and I think it's time for people that have got some robust kind of um, analytical properties in their own mindset to actually ask the question, well, where's the evidence that what you're telling us to do uh, is that actually works? And, the, here, and here's the situation with spend, because one of these other promises that the community will spend less money on gambling and that'll be better for everybody. Well, all that's happened is the spend has migrated over to other things. So in fact, the total amount spent on gambling is at a record high, right? And, and, and that's being fueled by others. You know, the spend on lotto has gone up by 200%. In one year, it went up 58%. And it used to be that a $10 million jackpot was the limit. Now it's $44 million of a jackpot before it must be won. And the change from Big Wednesday to a two jackpot draws, that, that increased their turnover by 100%. That money is leaving the community. Very little of it is coming back. Unlike Class 4, where the commission is paid back to the local business and then the donations are returned to the local community. So we are seeing a migration of spend regardless of what people tell you. But if you've got less of one thing, you're going to get more of another. You squeeze the balloon in the middle, it pops out of the top. That's the way human behaviour is. And and the, the, the last promise is, don't worry, people won't notice the loss in funding. Oh, I'll tell you what they do, because they ring me all the time. So here's this graph at the top was put out by the DI, and it tracks the number of gaming machines, and you'll see this continued decline. Yeah, the initial significant drop was, was an administrative issue more than anything. But from the 23,000 down to where we are now, 14,000, in my mind, if, you, if this is a lineal relationship, you chop my machines by a third, I expect a third, at least give me a third reduction in harm. But here we've got the Ministry of Health saying there's been no change. So it's a lever, it's not working. But look at the tape on the bottom. In inflation adjusted terms, that's what's happened to community funding. Even though the industry has driven the so a 39% return of GST um, exclusive revenue in 2003 is now a 43% return and GST has gone up to 15%. So that's the equivalent of about 45.5%. So the industry's efficiency has improved dramatically, but the amount of money being raised has declined in inflation adjusted terms. 526 million in inflation adjusted terms down to 304 million. So you can't tell me it doesn't affect community funding. And what happened to the third box? Sorry? What happened to the third box? Oh, sorry, uh, Madam Chair, can you say that again? The third box on your slide yeah. for 2019-2020. Yeah. Oh, that's just got the difference. If that's, if that's blocked at the moment. That's probably got my picture on it, isn't it? Um, that's just simply the difference in, in movement, if you like. So it's gone down $220 million in, in today's dollars. Oh right, okay. Yeah, we can't we can't see that, but yeah, probably because of your picture. But that's all right. We're having a look at you. Okay. So that's 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 really what. If I actually if I turn my camera off, is that um? That's all right. Just go to the next one. Right, and and look um. Well, really, that's about that's all I've got really got to say about those three things because those are the things that people are people argue over that this will help. This will help. Well, that just actually is at odds with the nature of the disorder that we're dealing with here. What helps is identifying people and intervening in their behaviour. And that can't happen unless you've got trained and qualified people. The idea that somehow or other um, miraculously behaviour would morph into something else, that's just not the way human behaviour works. 
And you know that that argument about money being spent in retail. One is there's no guarantee it will be spent in retail. It's what we've seen is the pattern. It just heads into um, it heads into other um, uh, it heads into other forms of gambling. Um, and uh, and basically, the the if, the if you read the fine print on that report they commissioned, is they said they hadn't taken into account the number of people employed in our sector, both in the the venues themselves and the amount of uh, jobs that are supported by the community funding that's generated. So, you know, our position is that that the sinking lids served its purpose. It's time to start to stabilise. One of the advantages you've got is that these venues are spread out across a a very um, geographically dispersed um, peninsula, which means that the actual exposure to the population is by community, and it's actually you know you've got teams, you've got uh, Fidiang, you've got Coromandel, and the machines are evenly spread out over those communities. You don't get a lot of migration between the three, some, but it's not an easy road to drive, is it? It's not the type of thing people sit at home and I think oh, I'm going to drive from one place to another. The danger is you get a fire, an earthquake, some sort of thing that disrupts it, and community funding is gone. And we've got whole areas around the country now where they don't have any access to class four funding um, and, they're, and they're worse off. So look, you're a well-led organisation, very mature um, council. You'll make up your own mind. Uh, we're happy to, I think we're good corporate citizens and we're, and we're happy to continue there. We work with the people at Frankie's over in Fittianga and they're lovely people, very committed to their business, all aspects of it. Um, uh, we'll, we'll still be there next year, whatever you do. But I just, I, I, I just wish there was a, you were served better with your advice, and that's that's about it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Martha. Okay, are there any questions of Martha? So I do have one, Martha. So if you if you take take a view that um, online gambling has a correlation with the um, state of class for gambling policy and the direction that that takes, that there is a link, there is a, an effect. If, if that's the case, um, is there any data on the increase in online gambling and consequently with an increase in population? Well, people like Sky City who launched an online casino just before COVID reported a, a massive increase. The TAB, you had Nile on there before, they now have about 60% of their entire transactions is done through their online accounts. So people are very quickly moving into that mode. And uh, when the class four sector was shut down, all online activities registered an increase. And what, what, what surprised me is that the head clinician of the Problem Gambling Foundation, a gentleman called Phil Townsend, who, who left to work in um, Melbourne in Victoria, um, Basically, he said his biggest was concern was the rapid increase in the number of people he was seeing with online gambling addiction because there's no limits and controls on, on that activity. So um, the, the actual uh, uh, individual performances, it's all quite anecdotal at the moment, but it certainly was there. And, and, and um, the minister herself uh, referred to it when she did a presentation to G-Man basically about two months ago. And she said, we don't have to speculate on what would happen if we shut down the class four industry. We just saw what happened. We saw a massive influx of people into the online sector. And they're very concerned about it. Their entire policy effort for the last three years went into the online, trying to uh, prevent growth in the online sector. I, the PGF have it wrong. There's no legislation anywhere near being written. But it looked like they were trying to, going to try and geo-block the, the off, on, offshore sites. Now, whether the new government will take up that, um, I don't know. Okay, thank you, Martin. No, I really appreciate that. It uh, picks up some really good points that we'll be taking heed of as we work through our deliberations. So, appreciate your time on that. Appreciate thank your time you. on board. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi. Right, are you So, um, do we move in? Can we extend the principal? Uh, yeah. There's some um, resolutions associated with the report, which is um, the report we received and the submissions we received. Uh, and that the substantive decision will be made at the December meeting. Yeah, I can think of the end. page 54. Okay. Here we go. Yes. So, the resolution is that we receive the hearing for gambling policy report and receive, we receive the submissions. Do I have a mover? Tony, second Murray, any discussion? All those opposed, they are. Uh, against carry. So we now go to 
the uh, minutes for confirmation. So um, we're on page three, and we try and read a Do I believe them? Do you want to seek the Terry? Any discussion? There being none, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against Terry. Mercury Bay Community Board Minutes, Move Tony, Seconded Murray. Any discussion? No matters, anyone wants to raise, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against Terry. Tribal Power and Community Board Minutes. So moved. Move Terry, second down. Yeah. Robin. Oh, sorry, John. Second of Robin. Um, any discussion? If we know it was a favor, please say aye. 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 Against Terry. Temps Caramando. Oh, sorry, Temps Caramando. Sally. Second of Robin. Any discussion? If we know all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Against Terry. Home for Time Committee Board. So moved. Move Terry, second of John. No discussion. There being none, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yes, Terry. Emergency Management Committee minutes. Um, just before I put this, can I just have clarification on the second point of the resolution? That definitely, um, I'm still the ex officio. Oh, yes, yes. that was the yeah. whole point, wasn't yeah. it? We were sometimes a bit short on quorum, and so yeah. Martin was always attending, so that was absolutely as many of you always yeah. were committed, but we were just a bit short on quorum. That was the whole point. We were not trying to get rid of it. Oh, no, 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 just to be clear, Sally so did discuss it with me, and we did. And, and that was that was totally all agreed, you know, because it was great that Martin wants to participate. And frankly, the more that are aware of what's going on in terms of, we just have that connection with emergency management computer. You know, it is quite important because when something starts to go belly up, um, it's pretty important for us in this district. So on that basis, uh, do we have a mover? Yeah. Move Sally, second of Robin, all those in favour, please say aye. Against Kerry. Um, order and risk. Move. All right. Um, Any discussion? Move. Any discussion? There being none, all those in favour, please say aye. Against Kerry. Um, one thing I haven't been asking is Gary, but Gary, you'll you'll just chip in when you need to. I hope. Well, and Martin. I've just clicked my sound off. Um, I just wanted to. I, I'm sorry. We just moved on past it, but on 2.3, uh, the um, uh, where is it? Um, the um, uh, indoor alert device is that now finished with? That's right. Yes, that is. Yes, that is. That's what I. That's what I read it as being, but I just yep. wanted to confirm that. Thank yep. you. Yeah, no, the emergency management committee have done a very good job on that one, and we worked through it, and so we're in a very good space. Of having properly explored our what options are available to us, and so they're continuing to work through that. So well done, and thank you, Sally, and your team. Um, now we have the teams coming in district council minutes for that mover. Sally, second up. Uh, oh, Robin's got the okay. Yeah, sorry, Terry. All those. Oh, any discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yes, Terry. So that's that one. So do we do any more there? Tea break. Oh, yeah. it's tea break. Yeah. yeah. I think you've deserved a tea break. Thank you, team. We'll have a tea break for quarter of an hour and then we'll have two in the Thank you. Oh, oh, Thank you. 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 Thank you.